everyone uh, for day two, where we're going to start out talking uh, through chapter three, which will be math and curve fitting. And Darius, you can hear me okay, right? And you can see the composed screen, correct? Yes, you're okay. coming through. Very good. So we'll uh, pick right back up from where we left off yesterday. And just as before, we'll do kind of a, a toggle between PowerPoint and the application. Therefore, I'll leave the PowerPoint in kind of this edit mode. So this chapter is uh, about some of the introduction of the math concepts and also some uh, of the curve fitting commands, which um, make this really straightforward to do aspects of curve fitting and um, management of coefficients for polynomial curves and the like. So in the big picture of the class, we have moved um, past through the general usage and environment, which you're used to now. And then we talked about some very general functions yesterday, all the three C's to start a script with, as well as various data types, all the way up through cell and structures. And uh, now we'll move on to the math and the curve fitting. So um, out of the you know 579 functions that are built into 2017.2, there are a vast majority of those that relate to, or I should say a very sizable group of those that relate to general math functionality. And um, these really provide a foundation uh, when you're gonna write your own functions downstream. Um, and so it's good to get these understood. Several of them will look very familiar as to some things that you see in your everyday calculator. There's gonna be some others that might be new, especially if you haven't used the um, the other software uh, on the market, that, uh, the softwares that use this format. All right, so let's start out with just a couple of uh, constants in here. So pi and e are built into the code, as you might expect. And just go right into the code, type them, in format long, and format short. So there's a little bit of control there for kind of the default way that it echoes. So, and the same with the 2.7. For the e. Now, one of the things to be careful about is the software does let you overload a built in variable. So if you're coming along here and you say, you know, a equals one and b and c and d, you know, equals two, and then you go e equals eight, well, you've just overloaded uh, the one that is in the code. So um, there's a function, you can see if that. Uh, yeah, that's more for functions, not the constant. So if you do overload the variable, uh, be careful, be aware of that, and note that uh, E is one of them that is kind of right up there and easy to accidentally over override. So Then you get into some general math functions, and most of these that I show, you can pass, like any functions, you pass arguments in, and those arguments can be just an individual number. They can be an individual complex number, or they can be a matrix. That can be a one by matrix, or it can be a you know, row vector, column vector, or full matrix. And by default, this function will apply to every member in whatever is passed into the map. So uh, by the way, ceiling returns, as you might expect, uh, the next integer towards the positive part of the number axis, and it returns the next integer greater than the given number, unless the number provided is itself an integer, in which case it's just gonna echo back um, that number that you put in. Uh, if the argument's complex, the function will return the next largest integer um, uh, for both the real and the complex parts. So let's play around with that function a little bit. So we'll do our clear, and we're gonna use ceiling. So you got the easy stuff, right? 5.5, so 5.3 goes up to six. Ceiling of negative 4.2 going to move towards the positive number line, so it moves up to four. Ceiling of negative uh, 4.2 plus 5.4i, it acts on both of the members of the complex number simultaneously. And then finally, if I give it some sort of a matrix, uh, perhaps I will do um, a equals random uh, four by six, and I'll multiply that times uh, three. So I get a random matrix, and then if I do a ceiling on that, then it does its thing uh, all the way through. Of course, in this case, I didn't have a, any negatives, so it's kind of 
easy, but you see the concept. If I was to create a row vector or a column vector, say equals uh, a equals minus 1.2, 1.3, 9.0, 2.3, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, 8.0, 9.0, 10.0, 11.0, 12.0, 13.0, 14.0, 15.0, 16.0, 17.0, 18.0, 19.0, 20.0, 21.0, 22.0, 23.0, 24.0, 25.0, 26.0, 27.0, 28.0, 29.0, 30.0, 31.0, 32.0, 33.0, 34.0, 35.0, 36.0, 37.0, 38.0, 39.0, 40.0, 41.0, 42.0, 43.0, 44.0, 45.0, 46.0, 47.0, 48.0, 49.0, 50.0, 51.0, 52.0, 53.0, 54.0, 55.0, 56.0, 57.0, 58.0, 59.0, 60.0, 61.0, 62.0, 63.0, 64.0, 65.0, 66.0, 67.0, 68.0, 69.0, 70.0, 71.0, 72.0, 73.0, 74.0, 75.0, 76.0, 77.0, 78.0, 79.0, 80.0, 81.0, 82.0, 83.0, 84.0, 85.0, 86.0, 87.0, 88.0, 89.0, 90.0, 91.0, 92.0, 93.0, 94.0, 95.0, 96.0, 97.0, 98.0, 99.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100
given a vector, it returns the largest value in the vector. So now this function is the first one where it's not just treating each member of the matrix on its own. It actually is treating its, um, it's looking through the, you know, pieces of the matrix. So let's read through this. If, uh, if you're given just a vector, remember there can be row vectors or column vectors, it's going to return back the largest value in that vector. If you're given a matrix, then what it's going to actually do is extract, and this is important because this applies through functions all over the place in this product. Is there are times where what the function wants to act on is a vector. And when you provide a matrix, what you can think of the matrix as is an array of vectors. And so it's going to apply whatever the function is to each individual uh, vector. And sometimes it's rows and sometimes it's columns, and you can control that depending on the argument. So if we look through here, if you're given a matrix, the function is going to return a row vector, meaning it's going to actually run this max on each um, column and then pick the number. And if you do that on you know two or more columns, you actually end up with a row vector. And if the given two matrices, if given two matrices, the function is going to find the maximum values pairwise. So it, this is also the beginning of where the behavior of the function is a bit dependent on what is passed into it. So there's permutations here that apply based on the, the, how many entities that you pass in you know, and what kind they are. So here, if it's just a matrix, so let's go one at a time here. If you just have a matrix, so let's say I have a, a matrix, which is one, um, two, three, four, five, six, to keep it easy. That matrix looks like this, it's two by three. And if I do a max on A and A alone, um, what it basically does is goes through uh, each column vector. And the biggest number in the one four column vector is four, biggest number in the middle column is five, biggest number is six. And that's why you get a row vector returned because it's run that operation on each column um, by default. Now, if I have a couple of different ones, let's say I have A uh, equals one, two, three, four, B equals uh, 0.25, I want to mix it up a little bit here, um, 0.6 and 7. So I have A and I have B. Now, if I pass those into the max function, it's actually going to trigger it to say, I'm going to compare 1 to 0.2, I'm going to compare 2 to 0.5, 3 to 0.6, and 4 to 7. So if we do a max of A comma B, we get that behavior and it says, okay, well, one is bigger there, five is bigger than two, three is bigger than 0 0.6, seven is bigger than 0.4. So take note of how the function behavior was dependent on how many arguments were passed into it. Um, one, one argument, in fact, not only that, but if I was to have passed in a single argument, let's say um, I would have just made a single one of one, two, three, and I do max of A. I mean, it's still behaving the same. It's returning a row vector, but the row vector length is one of the maximum in there. Um, and there's a, another thing you can do to control it. Um, so if given two matrices, it's going to do the pairwise. There's going to be the maximum value. Uh, and then you also, if you return the results of the function, you can actually also get a matrix, which is the index number of where that maximum is. Then the final argument controls which dimension. You're going to see this a lot in these functions that are looking for a vector because let's say you have a certain kind of matrix. If I had like that two by three matrix, you know, what if I want to find the maximum in each row and end up with a column vector versus finding the maximum in each column, which is what it defaults to, it returns a row vector. So you can throw in this last scalar value here, you can throw in a flag to basically say, uh, I want to change it over to be along the row. So let's just try that so it maybe makes it a little bit clearer to you. So I'm going to go back to that one, two, three, four, five, six thing I had. And it looks like this. And we know by default, if I do max of A, it's going to do uh, the max of the three columns. But if I do max of A column, uh, comma, 2, 
now it switches around. Um, and in this case, it's looking for the, um, actually this one's even a little different. Here it's actually looking for, for each member of the matrix is which one's bigger two. So this is yet even another use case is, that is two bigger than the number. So like two is bigger than one, so it returns two and it's a wash. And then three is bigger, four is bigger, five is bigger, six is bigger. Um, so that one is even a little bit uh, different. If you want to go into um, the uh, telling it to do the columns instead of the rows, <clears throat> in this case, I may have to go back and check this one to how to trigger that instead of just doing the uh, comparison of the exact number two here, because that is the reserved command. Um, and so let me play with that a little bit at a break and get back to you. Um, let me try one thing here on that just to see, because I hadn't actually done that use case in a little while. Oh, there it is. Yeah, just had to put in a blank matrix to, because it's, it's looking at for that flag of row versus column in the third position. And so you have to kind of trick it in this case and say, well, I'm not really doing two matrices compared to each other. So now what it does is it's looking here and the biggest number is three and the biggest number is six. Okay, so a little bit trickier than the first ones that we talked about, but um, an introduction to the concept where a function behaves differently depending on how many members you even saw when I when I did, you know, matrix comma scalar, it even behaved yet a, a different way. And so keep an eye out for functions that are like that. And then also for those functions that are really looking to operate on vectors, most of the time you have a choice of controlling whether you want it to behave on row vectors or column vectors. And it tends to default. It defaults a little different than you might think because it defaults by applying it to each column vector. And you have to tell it if you want to do row vector. Uh, minimum <coughs> is just the opposite. Same concept all the way through. So I don't really need to spend an example time showing that. Okay, absolute value. So this is basically returning, again, this is another one which is a bit dependent on the type of numbers that you're sending in. If you send in a standard uh, scalar value or a matrix full of scalar values, it will simply return the absolute value as we've all learned in fifth grade or whatever. But if you pass it a um, complex number or a matrix of complex numbers, it's going to actually calculate you know, the square root of the squares. Basically, it's going to calculate the magnitude of that complex number. Um, and notice, you might have saw this yesterday when I was typing and I typed mag. There, there is no mag function. So you have to think about it for um, when you want to have a complex number, you actually use ABS. So let's just look at those real quick. There's the brain. Brain dead easy stuff, right? Absolute value of a negative becomes a positive. Positive stays as it is, no big deal there. If you do a matrix, um, minus one, two, minus three, four, that's a, a row vector, it just does the absolute value on each member. Not too hard there. But if you throw in complex number, so negative 3.2 minus nine I, uh, that's actually the magnitude calculation. So that's the length of that vector. If you think of the real axis and the imaginary axis, this is the hypotenuse length on the real imaginary plane. And then of course, if you give it a vector of, of those. And remember, um, I think I mentioned before, if, if you have a matrix and you have even one single member, which is denoted as complex, and it's gonna turn that matrix and recognize everything as complex, even if the imaginary is zero. Let me show you what I mean. If I have a 1.2, um, I'm sorry, a minus 2, 3, and then I have 4.5, and I have a minus 1.3, 1.3, and then maybe towards the end there, I say something like minus i. That little minus i just told this uh, compose that I'm entering basically a matrix, and you're going to see it come back. Um, well, since I did ABS, let, let's do this real quick. I'll do it in two steps so I don't confuse you. Let me just show you the matrix. See how it echoes it back? Because the one instance of an I triggered it to say, well, obviously you're talking complex numbers all the way. And so you see zero I, zero I, zero I for the first ones. But so now, now given that, go back to 
doing the function, it's going to just spit out the magnitudes of each of the four. The magnitudes, obviously, for the first three are going to be the same values because i is zero, and then the last one's going to be, um, well, that neither one, none of them have a combination of both real and imaginary, so it's a pretty trivial case. But the idea is ABS, standard stuff for scalars, magnitude for um, complex numbers, whether it be given one complex number or an entire set of them. And if I was to do a multi-dimensional, I shouldn't say multi, if I was to do a regular two by matrix, something like this, comma, one, two, three, four, it's going to do that on all members, all complex members inside the matrix, okay? So not all too bad. Um, square root is similar in concept. It's going to run the standard function that we, uh, that we all know and it's gonna run it on each individual number. If you give it a matrix, whether it be a one by matrix or you know, n by matrix. Um, the one thing here to watch is that if you do give it a complex number or if you give it an array of complex numbers, there's actually this uh, fancy theorem of what represents the square root of a complex number. And it's uh, shown in the right hand side of this. So square root's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's again a function like ABS that we've all grown up with. And uh, you just have to recognize that, um, of course, this is how you can get you know real numbers right back to you if you have a square root of a negative. So if you do a negative, you know, minus uh, 15, that's where you're gonna immediately have complex numbers. And then you can go to the values. Of course, in the code, you can embed functions all day long within themselves. So that's kind of thing. Okay, keep going here. Um, sum is a uh, function that again is going to operate on um, rows and it's looking for a vector. You can control it like the other of whether you wanted to do the column vectors or the row vectors, but it is going to act on a vector or a set of vectors if it's a matrix that's given. So we just go back to our uh, one, let's do this. Then I can just click run every time for you guys. One, two, three, four, five, six. And let me make sure that this is, uh... all right. Then I can do one clap, snap click and uh, we have our matrix. So here, if I do sum of A, by default, it's gonna do those columns. So four plus one is five, five plus two is seven, six and three is nine. Um, if I were to go sum two, that flips it around. Now it's going to do three plus two plus one and six plus five plus four. Notice in this case, the sum function never takes two matrices. There is no use case and therefore the two is expected in count in the second position of the command versus that max min where it had to be in third position and given like a fake matrix or and really what it is a null set matrix. Um, so that's uh, pretty straightforward there and it'll do it on anything that you send it. So if I was to make B equal to uh, minus three plus I three 2.0 minus I, um, and then I do sum of B, that's just one simple one. It's gonna do standard math. Not too much rocket science there. Uh, log, similar thing, this is natural log. Now, this is important to note, there are uh, three different log functions in the code, and you want to know which one's which. So if you type log, here's the point I want to make. There is no ln function in the product. It is only log, and then it's which one do you use. So log with no arguments is natural log. So uh, log of e is one. If you want to log base 10, it's log 10 is the function. And if you want to log base two, it's log two is the function. So um, keep that in mind. No ln, natural log is the word log in the product. And again, this is all very consistent with the other two codes that are uh, on the market there. Well, one of them is open source and one's on the market. Okay, sign uh, returns uh, basically a plus or minus one based on the sign of the argument. And if you got a matrix, it's gonna do it for each member. And um, if you have a complex number, then the sign function will return 
complex number divided by the magnitude of the complex number. So it's kind of a normalization that takes place uh, in the case of um, complex. And if the one special case of zero, then sine is zero. So again, this one isn't all too tricky. It's not, this one's not, you know, so sensitive of what you send into it other than maybe complex versus non-complex. But, uh, you know, we can do sine of uh, uh, negative five, three, four, negative two, five. Oops. So it just kicks back. And you're able to use this in math. Like if you wanted to, you know, since all these functions return results that are effectively, you can store them in yet another variable, right? Like B equals sine of, uh, let me do it this way. This is where those arrows come in handy. I can just jump up to that guy and say B equals, and then I have that, now I have B matrix, and I can use that, and I can take it downstream or the like. So uh, pretty straightforward. Won't spend a lot of time on sign. Our factor is pretty handy, and this is another one that um, is going to take the number given and basically return every number that's involved at the, you know, the minimum amount of uh, uh, prime factors. Um, if you do assign this to a variable, then you can uh, get it in a second form, which is where it doesn't repeat it. So like here where you see factor 12, two times two times three is 12. Is 12. If you do it where you have this, you know, A, B, which is the first example I've shown you where you store the results of a function in something more than just a single variable. You can actually tell it to store. And this is all documented of which functions you can use to store something more than a single variable because a lot of them have this kind of extra data or extra special use uh, information you can extract out of the function. You just have to know to store it. You got to look in the documentation and know to store it in this way. So this one, this AB is basically saying, giving me a matrix back, um, the A is itself a uh, matrix um, that's showing the, the numbers that are used in the prime, but it's not um, uh, repeating it. And then B is telling you how many times it's used. So I know it's a little complicated, but it's introducing the concept of this, you know, getting a little extra data back. And then you kind of got to look at the documentation to understand the code. Like here, it's basically saying two is used twice, three is used once. So it's another form of information similar to what was given in the just the default of two times two times three. Um, so let's just play with flat factor a little bit. So factor of uh, 1,234 has these two primes. Um, factor of uh, the uh, negative one two three four is that. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, factors and the negatives. I haven't played with that too much. If I do a factor of um, 40, you, you know, we know that's five times two, two, two. So it's a neat way to get quick factors. If I throw some crazy number in here, you can uh, find very quickly. It, its performance is quite fast to find these these uh, these factors. And then if you do this thing where you do the a b equals factor of whatever then it stores, and so basically three, it's three t is used twice, and then 11, 13, 23, and 59 is used once. So if we do three times three times 11 times 23 times 59, we should get back that number. So real handy for a factor. If you give it a matrix, it's just gonna operate on each uh, number. So if I do factor of uh, 45, 65, 78, oops. Um, Ah, this function may actually uh, prefer only a single scalar value. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the picky ones that will uh, not actually run through. I, I stand corrected on that. There's not too many of these that are like that, but this is one of them where it just wants uh, a scalar. And the reason is, if you think about already how the data is being returned back, you got this option of, you know, having it come back in an A, B, well, if you then compound that with either being able to do an array or like a vector or an n by m, it can get real hairy to how to report that. So that's why they put the limit on that. I forgot about that for a second. All right, go back. Now you got your trig. Um, we've all done trig forever, so I'm not gonna spend 
any time on it other than to say everything is there, uh, built in, and you can apply it to um, a uh, matrix or any sort of number that you're used to. And then there's this uh, degree to radian and radian to degree built-in functions, which come in kind of handy. Just keep it, be aware that those exist there. Yeah. All right, we're gonna switch over then. And for a few slides, I wanna show you some really powerful uh, curve fitting capability. It's actually extremely easy to use. Uh, it's fast and um, really it can be, can be quite helpful. So the two of them that are complementary is uh, polyfit, which provides coefficients to the order that you ask for it, which is n. So you gotta give it some x values and y values. Those length of those vectors need to be the same. They need to be vectors and uh, what order that you want the polynomial fit. And then it will store that in the coefficients. Similarly, if you want to do the reverse and you have coefficients and you want to um, create the new y that's a function of the fit with some x's, then you can do that through polyval. And then you can even plot and look at those. So let's do that as an example here. All right, I'm going to make a little bit of a window here for the plotting. So let me clear all. And I will say, um, we'll start out and say x equals 0, uh, 0.1 to uh, 2 times pi. And let's see how long that guy is. Yeah, about 60 some points. Okay, good. And I'll make y equals the sine of x. We know those are going to be the same length. And I can plot x, y, and we all know what that's going to look like. Now let me do a fit based on the actual point. So the, you know, the, there's the X's, right? And there's the Y's. So got a lot of numbers in there and uh, there's uh, each one 63 long. So now let's get into finding a third order fit for this. So I'm gonna call this fit one equals poly uh, fit. And the order is it needs the X data, the Y data and the order of fit, which I want to do a cubic fit. And you might remember that returns four coefficients, right? Because you got the constant. So there's the fit. That was it. I have the fit coefficients. Now let me do a plot of what, how well that fit worked. So I'll go ahead now and create the new Y. And that's a polyval. And here, this may be a little bit against uh, intuition. You might think that you should give it the X value and then coefficients, but it's actually in, it's in reverse. You have to give it the coefficients and then the values that you want it to act on. So I create a new Y, the length of new Y better be the same as before, 63. Now I'm gonna do something you haven't learned yet, but I'm just gonna do a hold on to keep that plot from being replaced. I wanna keep the old one up there. And now I'll do a plot of the X and the new Y. And this lets me see the fit, which you can see there in the green. So um, polyfit and polyval, really easy to use um, and helpful to quickly do fitting of all different orders. And these slides are there for your reference as well as the documentation. So we just did something like that. Now, kind of similarly, you can find the roots of a polynomial. So here, if you have a particular uh, polynomial, like I have this one here, I actually have the fit data for this particular one. It's going to have three crossing points. I can go and just do the roots. So what's the roots of that same polynomial? Okay, it's going to cross not too far off of three, zero, three, and six, which we would expect, right, with the sine wave. Um, so very trivial, easy to find with the roots if you have the coefficients of a polynomial. Um, similarly, if you have the roots, you can then get your polynomial coefficients. So you can go the, the uh, other direction there as well. So if I was to go here and take these roots and say I wanted to do a, um, just a poly on those, and I can give it 6.6, 3.13, and 0 0.1. Oops. Oh, oh, maybe I should give it in the right form, like a little baby matrix here, a one by vector. And maybe I should type um, the right command. Okay, 
So <clears throat> there, there we get um, this, these uh, coefficients. You gotta make sure you do them in the right order. Uh, sometimes they're normalized. So if you get some numbers back and they don't exactly match, it could be because you did the, the wrong order. It could also be because it's normalized. Like if we take this example for a second that's in the slide. Um, I think this is one where, where it'll show that. So let's say I have, uh, I do a poly on a minus three, a plus three minus three. And I get these uh, coefficients. And then if I had done roots on the one zero nine, well, actually, in this case, I am going to get um, uh, the similar thing. So in uh, in some cases, it depends exactly on the case you're going to do. You may get back like some sort of um, equal divisor across the uh, coefficients that you gave. So like if you get coefficients of 2, 4, and 6, then you redo this reverse thing. You may come back and get 1, um, 2, and 3 is what I'm saying. So, um, so yeah, roots. Uh, to find where a polynomial crosses zero and the polynomial coefficient that corresponds to a given set of roots. So a couple of sister functions there. Then you can find derivative very easy. So it's like the calculus. So if I go back and I look at this fit one and we saw that fit to the green curve there, well, I can do a polydur of fit one and there's the coefficients for the derivative. And I can also do a poly int find out the coefficients of the integral of that polynomial. So it's just very easy, um, straightforward by passing it in through that uh, function. So just in review, because these are pretty powerful here to be aware to be aware of, to use is polyfit and polyval, kind of sister functions. Roots and poly are sister functions. Derivative of polynomials, standard stuff you did in calculus class, and integral. And then finally, there's a spline which basically does a, a cubic um, spline fit. And for that, you just give it a, uh, a new set of X and it'll find a new set of um, Y. So let's go back to this case here where I have, if I still have them in memory, I got my size X and my Y. Okay, so I have those still in memory. Well, I can go in here and say, well, I want um, new Y uh, two to equal spline of x ah, y, which is the pair. But then um, the last argument is basically what are the new x's that you want to send in. So in this case, I might say I want to have uh, points at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I get the y's that correspond to that, which are going to be right real close to those same curves. So the spline just lets you, it kind of lets you um, up sample and down sample uh, if you need to. Okay, so there, as I mentioned yesterday, in uh, various chapters, we list the other functions that are in a similar domain. You can always take a look at those. So there is an exercise here in the manual. In uh, chapter three, it's introduced beginning on Page 29, of course, you got the couple of blank pages and, the, and then the meat starts there on page 31. Um, so I want you to go ahead and go through that and uh, we're gonna give you on this one, you're gonna bounce through some of those, you're gonna do a little bit of trig and then you're gonna do the curve fitting. Um, so normally that would take a, a good fair bit. I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes because uh, with this material, even if you run out of time and we wanna make sure it's more important to cover all the material we want to cover and you can always take the extra few minutes if you need to later to um, finish any exercises. So let's go till 425 and then I'll uh, sign back on and we'll get into some details with major. Even if you haven't finished yet, again, you have all the material uh, through the help and through the training slides. There's a lot of material there to help carry you if, even if you work on the remaining part of the exercise later uh, today or like <clears throat> so what we want to do now is move into the next chapter, which is going to be um, uh, lots about matrices, which is, uh, as mentioned, the heart of how pretty much everything is stored. Um, and 
let's get into those starting with some uh, functions that help you populate some matrices. So this is chapter four uh, matrices. So there are built in several functions that get you started for uh, filling matrices of certain type, like there's the uh, identity matrix where your diagonal can be set to one. So if you do that on a square, like five by five, you get a nice looking um, matrix with the, uh, the identity matrix down the di uh, diagonal. If you do that with something less, say you do a three by five, then it'll do the best it can till it runs out of room and then pads everything else with zeros. If you do the opposite, then again, it does uh, the best that it can, pads the other direction with zero. So it will create the size of matrix that you ask for, um, but if it's an off square matrix, then it'll pad it with zeros. So that's just a quick way to make uh, a matrix with uh, an identity type matrix. Uh, there's a mesh grid function, which will create a uh, basically a mesh type uh, layout for the contents of the matrix and what it'll do is it'll take the vector that's created so like four five six seven and eight and then it'll uh, create as many rows of that as there are numbers uh, to fill in that gap so let's try mesh grid of one to seven so you have one two three four five six seven and you also end up with the seven rows for that to uh, Populate. And that's used um, potentially in certain downstream situations to create for plotting for surfaces. We'll get more into that when we do the plotting. Uh, zeros and ones, pretty straightforward there. Creates a matrix of whatever you asked for. Zeros, I want a seven by eight. Or ones, I want a four by three. Done. Very straightforward for that. But realize that sometimes you'll use these as a starting point. Like you might create a zeros matrix to get it initialized. Then you go in and populate very specific coordinates. And uh, that's one way to apply the functions. A few others, uh, not a number. So in Compose, you can actually hold a variable as a not a number or an infinite. It's kind of like a special case. And you can uh, do that with a, a single variable or you can do it with a matrix by filling up a whole, a whole matrix. So uh, five by six, easy enough. So just to be aware that they're there, easy to use. The one, um, same thing, by the way, with true, false, it will create, but remember how I talked about how Booleans get echoed back to you. They don't get echoed back in string characters like you see with the NAN and the imp, they get echoed back with uh, trues being one and zeros uh, representing false. But behind the scenes, it remembers that each of those are actually a Boolean type. Um, so that if you need to do an if on it. But the one that's probably used most out of these two slides is the RAND. The RAND function will generate the requested matrix size and it will um, basically follow a, a uniform type distribution to uh, populate between zero and one. So this is nice when you want to just um, have some values uh, uh, filled up to have some matrix populated with not zeros and ones or whatever. So if I do a six by seven, um, oops, maybe I should do that with out the semicolon, right? And then of course you can multiply that from there. So I could do it, you know, negative 1.5 times the random of whatever. And, and scale that matrix uh, up higher to be something that's not just between zero and one. And um, you know, maybe I'll make this a thousand times that. So you can uh, take the results of it and scale it how you want or muck with rows and columns or whatever you want to do. But it is neat for uh, a real quick way to get a populated non-zero um, matrix to work with for examples or scripts or the like. Okay, so now let's move into functions that are uh, designed to work uh, with matrices. And this, again, many of these functions allow you to return more than just the default amount if you were to just assign it to one variable or, or no variable. Um, 
I'm not going to go through every one of those because it will use up too much time. I'll go ahead and go in a little deeper on, on intersection here and I'll, a few others I may pick to go a little deeper, uh, meaning I'll show you what comes with B and C, but just want you to be aware and when you see it in the documentation that there are these functions again that you can get more out of them than just what meets the eyes there. So the intersection is basically going to compare uh, two matrices and what it's going to do is look and find where the same number is in in both. Um, in this case, since we did say we're going to talk a little bit deeper about getting back like B and C here, is if you're interested in not only the numbers that are in both matrices, but you're also interested in the position of them, then B will give you a row vector that describes the position of where those numbers are in the first matrix, and C will give you that for the second. So let's just try that real quick. Um, so first, again, if you give no arguments, so let, well, let's get ourselves some matrices here. Say I do this at 45, 67, 89, and 102. And we'll say B is um, 7, 45, 99, and 67. So kind of a nice mix. Notice there that there's a couple that are in the same one. So again, if I don't give it any argument, and I just do intersect of A and B, uh, what would you expect? Here, what it's going to do is echo back the numbers that uh, have at least one instance in both. So 45 and 67 are in both. And again, when I don't assign it to multiple variables, or if I just assign it to one, like uh, DD equals intersect AB, I get that same thing. So it's only when I go and say, I want to know like X, Y, and Z where I follow the syntax with this matrix and store where I get the extra stuff. So you gotta gotta watch that in those cases where you uh, want that because by default you're not you know it's it's on purpose because the vast majority use case is that you don't need that other data, but it provides you a doorway to get it if you need it. So here what we should see is X is just going to be what the regular result is. So X is going to be 4567. The Y is going to be um, a little uh, vector that describes for the first one what is the position. So 45 here is in position 1, 67 is in position 2. So we should see a 1, 2 for the uh, y. And then z is going to say where are those. It should be like a 2, 4 for the other. So sure enough, there's what is intersected. There's the positions, the, in, the indexes of where they are in first one and indexes in the second one. So um, pretty straightforward and you can play with it from there, but it's a handy um, function. And also gives you a little feel of how to get those extra data out of there. So, and then you can play with it with an actual matrix. And again, it starts to grab vectors out of the matrix and just goes up the next dimension. So that's just showing what I described there. Union, um, very you know, opposite of intersection. So the union uh, is gonna basically a look at all the elements in both input matrices or input vectors and um, create uh, a new one that is in the ascending order. So let's just give that a try here. So if we go back to A and B and we do a union of A and B, again with no arguments, it just basically uh, sorts them. It, it takes, you know, um, each unique number creates a new row vector uh, and ascends, puts them in ascending order. And again, you can look and see what the various aspects are that you have control over in the indices, similar thing with the indices. And you can uh, go in, um, you go ahead and tag to use, you know, uh, rows. Like, like earlier in some of those commands, I had to give it like a one or a two to determine if it behaved on rows or columns. Here, the actual default is, um, if you give it full matrices, it's going to behave on the columns, and then you can tag it with an actual string of rows, and uh, it'll follow suit from there. So that's the union function. Uh, find. So find is a function which is used pretty often in uh, real-world scripts, and it's going to return the indices of elements that are non-zero in the matrix. 
and if you want to and you want to do the you know the, the this row column type you can also um, get the information for um, basically where uh, those guys are at from I mean well you sorry you get the indices by default um, but the other ones will find actual coordinates so if you have a a matrix. So let's talk for a second about when we when we refer to indices. So if I go to a matrix, say A equals one, two, three, four, five, six, which actually is going to correspond to. Let me let me do something that's not going to be exactly the same numbers. Three, one, eight, nine, eleven, thirteen. Okay, that's better. So I got this matrix now. We all know that rows columns wise, you know, the first one is row one, column one, and 11 is uh, row two, column two, and eight is row one, column three. But what if I want to give a numer a single value numerical index for where these are? And that um, reads like a book. So this would be position one, this index two, index three, index four, index five, index six. There are functions where you provided a matrix and it when it sends the results back it just wants to give you the um the coordinates but in a single scalar value and so that's the way you turn a matrix uh, coordinate position into single value so um if i do a find here let's try this let's say uh let's make going and make a with a lot of zeros so i'll make that zero zero, zero, and then we'll leave the nine, the zero, and the 13. So I've just modified A. And now I'm gonna do find A. See how I get two and six? Okay, so what it's doing is it's looking and it's, if you look at this position, um, oh, sorry, I misspoke a second ago. It starts down, it's not like a book. It uh, actually starts down reading down columns. I remember that, it goes a little bit against intuition and it even got me on that. So here, this is one, and this is two, and this is three, this is four, this is five, and this is six. So do keep an eye out uh, for specific functions whenever they're gonna return information about uh, the index of where something is in a matrix. In many cases, it'll return a single scalar value to represent that index, and you gotta know to count in this way of, uh, you know, uh, down the row, uh, down the columns, until you um, get to that number. Now, in this case, there is a ability to do this row column bit, which will actually go ahead and give you a little more about actual row column coordinates. So if I do that, row column D equals uh, find A. Now you actually do get some information. Okay, it's in coordinate two, two, it's in coordinates one, three, um, and uh, um, and then there's a the regular value, the actual values. So, so that's a new concept um, and keep that in mind and keep in mind that it actually, whenever you do get that index, single value index for a matrix, that it's walking down the columns. So it's kind of like uh, the opposite of how you read a book. Sorry about the misspeak on the first one on that. So there's just examples that show that. All right, then a couple little handy ones, um, all will return true if the values um, of a vector are all uh, non-zero. If a single one of them is zero, then it will be false. And you can tell it again here of whether you want it to walk down rows or walk down columns, you have the control over that. So let's just do a quick all check. So if I have A equals uh, one, two, four, five, I do all of A, it's going to say, yep, they're all uh, non-zero. If I was to have anything in there be zero, it triggers the response of the all to be non-zero. Now, if I have a matrix, a little bit more of a matrix, like uh, one, two, three, five, and then two, three, oh, well, let's keep that one all. Um, and now this goes back to the rows columns. So if I do a, an all of A, what it's doing now again is by default, it's looking through the column. It says, well, out of one and two, they're both non-zero. So that's a one. 
Out of two and three, they're both non-zero, so that's a one. Uh oh, out of zero, one, one of them is a zero, so false, five, one, so one. And then that's where you can give that second dimension, which I think is two, and it'll go the other direction for that. So that's all, and it has a sister complementary function called any. And that's basically you return true if any of the elements are uh, non-zero. Otherwise, it's identical for as far as uh, logic goes. Okay, now uh, you get into sort. So here's where you can um, sort it in ascending or descending order. And this is going to just um, do just what it says, pretty straightforward. So let's go back to this one, and if I do a sort of A, so again, by default, it does the 1, 2, and then a 2, 3, a 1, ha. okay, good. One of them is switched, so then it turns that into 1, 5, and then if I tell it to sort 2, then it goes the other way. It turns that one into 0, 1, 2, 5, and a 1, 1, 2, 3. Um, so that's something that takes a little bit of getting used to because uh, the human intuition would be that it goes by how you read a book when it does, uh, when it's cherry picking vectors out of a matrix, but it's actually the opposite in the majority of these functions where it's actually starting out and it's going to uh, act on uh, grabbing vectors as, as columns. And then you got to tell it if you want it the other way. So keep that in mind. That's one of those that's just nice to know ahead of time. Um, again, as with many, there's these other offside data that you can get, but we'll leave that to, to you looking through uh, documentation so you don't have to cover everything. Size um, and number elements, very commonly used. You've already seen me use those um, several times. And so size of a, a matrix just returns that. And we got this example here, so size of A. Straightforward, notice how it stores it in a row vector, right? Because I can go in here and then just say B equals size of A. And now I have BB as, whoops, as its own um, that's why you can put in that delay. I haven't set it up in this build, but you can put in a one second delay and it kind of prevents it, these uh, ones where you have a, uh, a function name that is a subset of a larger string that is itself another function. Um, sometimes um, that can get you like that and you just go to the preferences and put in a little one second delay before it does the suggestions and get around that. All right, so again, I'm just trying to show you that uh, the output of these functions themselves can be stored as yet another matrix, like in this case a one by two, the vector, and then you can run with that and do whatever you want with it. But that's size, and then there's number of elements. Um, and that just gives you back the, the count of how many elements are in place. It doesn't have to do with if they're positive or negative or zero or anything, it's just the number of elements. So that's these two functions here. All right, a few more to go through. Uh, so you have a cumulative sum, and that basically walks through the vector and continues to add it up. So again, if we look at our example here, and you do a cumulative sum of A, again, by default, it's going to go down those columns. So you got 1 is just 1, and then 1 plus 2 is 3. You got 2, which is 2. The first one's just going to be a repeat, but then 2 plus 3 is 5. 0 plus 1 is 1. 5 plus 1 is 6. And if I had a third row, it would have added the third row to create that, that third row there. And then if I do the flip, it'll go the other way and I should get kind of a, uh, a one, three, three, eight kind of thing, let's see. Um, oops, I put a three in there. <laughs> I was thinking three, I said three, so I typed three. Let's go back to two. There we go. So now it's taking one, and the next member is adding one and two to get the three. And it's adding one, two, and zero, so that stays three, and it adds one, two, zero, and then adds the five and gets the eight. So then I got two, five, six, seven. And that's on cumulative sum, and there's the same thing as on cumulative product. Same concept, but multiplying instead of adding. So cumulative sum, cumulative product. All right, and then um, there's this function called uh, unique. And this is basically um, returning which values are not in the other uh, matrix. So if we go back to, whoops, go back to here with the CLC, and I say um, 
I'm going to do a couple different ones so I don't mess up my nice little A matrix there. So if I say C is uh, 1, 3, 4, 8, D is equal to uh, 3, and 2, and 7, and 1. Now let's just keep that um, 6. So now if I do unique C and D, Yep. Um, oh, I'm doing a misuse on this one. Hang on. Um, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to give it the uh, actual. There we go. So um, with the one, three, uh, four, eight here. Uh, let me get this into a form. Let me go actually back. Sorry about that. I run this one in a little bit. Um, if I go back to A, and do a unique A. And here it's working off the matrix. So I was trying to supply it to independent um, rows. Uh, so here, if you look, um, there's uh, the zero uh, uh, that is unique. Um, then it's going and putting them in ascending order. So the unique vector, um, unique values of the vector in the first argument in the row column vector. Uh, the IA, if we were to return all of these, uh, relates the vector in C. That's just about finding the indices. Um, Yeah, I got to come back to this one. I hadn't used it in a while, and it's getting me. So, ah, yes. So, yeah, this one I remember being tricky. So it's uh, uh let me do this. After I'm going to refamiliarize myself with this one, and I'll get it back to you in the break. I remember this one is always kind of a weird one. It's not real intuitive what's going on there. So let's move into some operations that you can perform. So there's the dot product. Remember that's just taking each same position value in a vector, multiplying it by each other, and then adding them all up. So if I go back to my C and D, and I do so C and D, and I do dot product of uh, C and D, that's going to be like a 3 times 1 plus a 3 times 2 plus 7 times 4, and you get an 85. So that's uh, pretty straightforward to use, just a straightforward dot product. And, uh, and by the way, dot product physically kind of represents the projection of uh, uh, one vector onto another vector. Then you got a cross product. You may remember doing with matrix algebra. And this, uh, if you have a three by three, so we'll do this, one, two, three, mm equals four, five, six, and then cross. And then that follows the math that we're all used to using. So that one is picky about the length of the vectors that you get. So that's just cross product. Again, some uh, matrix algebra type things that you've done before. Transpose a matrix. Uh, there's actually an easier way to do this, but there is a function. So if I go back to my A, I can do transpose of A, or I can just do A with this little tick uh, quote. Either one gets you the transpose. But there's, uh, there is the function for it, just to be aware of. All right, here this uh, basically pulls out the diagonal of a matrix. You can do some additional side things if you need to as well. But we'll keep going because I'm hoping to get into uh, the other chapter to finish the chapter beyond this too before the end of our time today. We'll be right on schedule. Um, so let me go here and uh, do this uh, diagonal. So I'll get some sort of a... Maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kind of matrix. Nice little three by three there. Notice how it just extracts those out and puts it into um, the column vector there. So pretty straightforward. And you can play with different dimensions and how does it treat it if it's non-square one way or non-square the other. That's all. Uh, once you're aware of the function, you can always um, play with that and also learn about some of the side uh, uh, permutations that you can throw at it as well. I want to keep going on this. 
determinant of a matrix. So that's pretty uh, pretty handy to have uh, to be able to just type right in, right? So if you have a, a square matrix there, you can run a determinant, which in this one is basically zero. And that can be, this goes back to, you know, maybe I say um, DV equals a random of uh, seven times seven, and then do a determinant of, I don't know what I call it, DV. So it's pretty fast. Of course, that kind of can, you know, exponentially go up if you have really big matrices, but it is uh, straightforward to run some of those linear algebra type. So that's your determinant, and then the inverse of the matrix. So again, if you have a um, matrix here like VV, and you can just invert it right there through the command. So if you do V times inverse VV, Make sure you follow the linear algebra rules, obviously. Um, oh, that's because I did B times B. There you go. And that's a big old matrix of zeros. So, so that, yeah, so think when you think linear algebra, uh, diag determinants, inverses, transposes, um, eigenvalues. So, this is following the uh, math to basically um, calculate the eigenvalues involved. This ties in real world back to vibration. And um, uh, real imaginary plane and stability and things such as that. So you can uh, look through that, and that one's a little bit hairier as far as the math that's underneath it. So just want to make you aware that it's there. Then the rank of a matrix, and more linear algebra that you may have learned in the past. And then a reference to a few other commands. So we're right on schedule because I want to give you uh, a few minutes for this exercise. And on page uh, 45 is the matrix exercises, um, or the exercise for the uh, matrix chapter. I'm going to get to get a little bit of hands on. This one usually takes a few more. I want to have about 20 minutes of lecture and 10 minutes for the final exercise. So I'll give you about eight or nine minutes on this, and we'll start right up about 5 or 501. Um, and again, no big deal if you can't finish, you got all the material in front of you, because this one normally does take a little more than the nine minutes. So I'll stop talking now and give you your, uh, uh, your nine minutes or final chapter of today, which is going to be all about plotting. And uh, when we deal with plotting, there is obviously the need to control the, uh, the aesthetics of the plot. And um, there's way to do, ways to do this interactively, and then there's also ways to do it programmatically, and that traces back to these things called handles, which we'll talk about. So let's get the big picture. Um, you've already seen me create a few plots during the course here. Uh, and the way to think of plots is actually it lives in a little bit of a hierarchical setup. Uh, the highest level being a figure, which is effectively a uh, like on the left here is a, a blank tab. You can have as many figures as you want in your session. And then on a figure, you can actually have multiple, one or multiple plots. And inside of a plot, uh, you have what's called these axes, where you can control the various aspects of the axes, and then you can have um, actual lines uh, within that. So if we start out, there's a couple different things about the way this behaves in that you can go in and if you want to, you can go and say, I want a figure. The code's also smart enough to know that if you're going to create a plot, <clears throat> it knows it has to go on a figure, so it'll create one automatically if you don't have one there. So if I do a close, which by the way, when we did the CLC and the close and the co close all, that's where this comes in for this um, uh, entity here. So if I wanted to just do a plot, for example, and I'm just going to do a silly one here, then um, it automatically creates the figure. It automatically creates it to carry one set of axes in one plot. But if I want to, I can actually go in and do multiple plots. And this is through um, a neat feature that's called a subplot. And it works with that same row column type of logic. So once I have a figure, if I wanted to have, let's say, 
uh, two rows by three columns, then I just type subplot two, three, and that tells it to kind of form that layout. Oops, um, got to tell it which one I want to act on. You always have to have one of them be current. So let's say I do number three, and you remember that um, uh, indexing, uh, and in this case, it actually, so here's a little bit of confusion. In all the functions I showed in the previous chapter, whenever there was any sort of single numerical index, it was always going down the columns, remember? Here, it actually does like a book read. So here, position three is the third position to the right. Or if I went down and set four, that's going to be this guy. And whatever the current um, axis is that's being worked on, if I create a plot, then uh, that's what, where it's going to go, is whichever one is ah, currently active. So, and if I go back and say, well, I'll go back to uh, plot three. Now that's the active axis. And now I can plot inside of that one. And then of course you can have multiple figures, right? You can go on to figure two, figure three. Okay, so you can build up, you know, through uh, your scripts, you can build up an enormous report of plots uh, that are populated with subplots. And of course those subplots can have multiple lines. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so figures is the highest level. Underneath figures are uh, these subplots. just like I had shown there. Now, there are a lot of different plot types that are supported in the code. So let's walk through each of those a little bit and then get into how to control some of the attributes and, and the look feel. So um, when you see, by the way, in these, these slides and you always are seeing this H equals, that ties back to the handle management. I'm gonna talk about that at the end, um, do a little bit of demo on the handle management, which is the programmatic ability to control plot attributes. Uh, and in order to do handle management, you have to store the handle that goes with your plot. And that's why you see in each of these, this H equals, you don't have to do, you saw me just now do a plot without storing it because I wasn't planning on doing any um, aesthetic control. But in the more real world script management, you are gonna do uh, script based programmatic control, hence, H equals. So uh, first one is a uh, plot. And in many of these, you're going to see something called this FMT. That stands for like your format specifier. Um, there are actually kind of three degrees of freedom that you can control uh, for the format specifier. And it's basically the, the line uh, type, um, the color, and the uh, symbol type where each XY pair shows up. And I'll touch on those uh, at the uh, farther down here. Um, so a plot is your typical standard um, line plot on a 2D map or 2D axis. So you've seen me do that already a few times. Um, you can do uh, multiple sets of XY pairs if you want to. Uh, a lot of these, my main goal today is just to make you aware that they exist because when it really gets to using it, you're gonna dig into the help and look at the subtleties about the different aspects. Um, but plot is your typical XY pair. And there's an example. And just to give you a little sneak preview on that for format specifier, um, there are a preset stored codes for the color and the symbol and the line type. Um, I covered a little bit more with, I have the tables of all the choices a little farther down, but since it is in this slide, we can point out where you see this, you know, G dash dash X, it's basically gonna plot that second line with a green curve and a dashed line and putting X's <coughs> on the symbols. And there are uh, a dozen or so colors you can choose from and a dozen or so uh, line types you can choose from and a dozen or so plus or minus uh, symbol types that you can do too. Um, you can control uh, line width, but that's not inside of the format specifier. That's its own attribute called line width. Uh, and there's actually some other things you can control too. <clears throat> so you can also take data and store it in a scatter plot. Now, each of these slides give you a little bit of information. Like here you see, you know, after the data, there's color, style, property, and value. And then you look down here, color, style, um, property value is uh, property that controls the 
um, graphic object and the handle. So there's a little bit of information there, but of course the help has everything that you need there. You can do a line plot in 3D space. So there you need an X and a Y and a Z vector. You can create something like you see at the bottom right there. Uh, get into 3D a little bit and you can plot a surface. And this also goes back to that mesh grid a little bit where you, you can create some uh, corresponding data to basically have a, a Z as a function of X and Y type of um, aspect. And you can see that here in the slide in the top right, we have uh, X as a vector, Y as a vector, and then Z is this made up function of X and Y, in this case, sine of uh, transpose of X times cosine of Y. And when you have that um, two dimensional uh, matrix of Z, you have everything you need to be able to do a surface plot of X, Y, and Z. That number that kicks back goes back to the handle concept that we'll talk about soon. So you can do line plots in 2D and 3D. You can do uh, scatter plots. You can do surface uh, in 3D. You can do a contour plot. And you can do that in uh, 2D. And it's basically where it does the various shadings based on uh, uh, values of some kind of Z value. You can do a contour in a 3D space as well. Similar thing where it'll take the various bands of values uh, for the Z and color their ranges to visual feedback. Do water flow plot to create um, something similar in a 3D type space. You can now do polar plots. So that's your uh, uh, um, you know, zero through uh, 360. Um, not to be confused with a Bode plot, which is a separate thing for uh, transfer functions and vibrations. Um, but it's a, basically a way to map in the, uh, yeah, in polar coordinates, effectively. Uh, you can get into semi-log Y and a log log. Again, all these are similar as far as it's plotting a line, but you can control the axes right off the bat to be semi-log axes. Log log plot. Okay, so there's all those different ones. Um, do a couple of demos, and I also want to show you, the slides didn't really have it, but I want to show you a little bit about the interactive control before we go into the handle management. So let's just say A equals uh, 1 to uh, uh, 10. And let's do this, say 1 to 2 pi. And B is equal to sine of A. All right. Now, again, if I just do plot A, B, it knows the creative figure. It knows it's going to do one. And uh, I made it pretty coarse there. But that's fine for what we're going to do. Because what I want to show you is interactively, there's a good bit of things you can control if that's your use case. Sometimes people want to write scripts and have everything done, which is what we're going to cover at the end here. Um, and I want to finish talking by 520 so that that way you can uh, work, have 10 minutes to work the exercise. But basically, it comes down to right mouse click and context sensitivity. So if I click here on the axes, I get the control. Is it a linear scale, a log, decibel scale, um, some format uh, information, uh, what the actual ticks are, or what the actual ticks and um, min and max are of that uh, axis. So these things are called micro dialogues. They're like these little um, embedded dialogues that are context dependent. So you can get that for the X, or and, and well, that with the Y, and here's the X. Um, you can also go and have the more general uh, uh, information of the whole plot in that context where you're just out here in the middle of nowhere. You can also get on top of the line and control aspects of the line. So that gets into your line type, your line color, your line thickness. Um, now, I should say, again, I can't remember if I said this at the beginning of the class yesterday, but I have a uh, I have a laptop that has that ultra high resolution, and uh, right now there are very few codes that properly scale. So when you see this kind of crunched a little bit on my machine, that's not going to happen on yours. It has to do with the hardware that I purchased interacting with the particular product here. Um, so just keep that in mind when you see these ultra small kind of dialogues. Um, so yeah, through the uh, context menus, you can control uh, a lot of a lot of things, but Suppose that you 
want to run a script and you don't want to touch anything interactively. You just want to suck in data from a file and plot it and have it night look just like you want it to look when the script finishes running and give control back to you. This is where handles come in, where many of the same attributes that you saw through the uh, interactive dialog, micro dialogues um, can be accessed programmatically. So let's look at it briefly in the slide and then we'll pop it off with an example. So, <clears throat> oh, first I um, wanted to mention that those tables for the format specifier, uh, those are in the slides, they're also in the help. So here's the color codes on this slide. Here are the symbol types on this slide. Here are the line types on this slide. And this is just one of those, you, you just go back to the reference material when you need it. Um, you know, usually memorize a couple of your favorites and then from there you go on. Uh, there's the micro dialog we, we talked about. I should mention too, before getting onto the handle management, that there are a few, a few of those aesthetic attributes have shortcut commands already built in uh, so that you don't have to go through kind of the little bit more cumbersome file uh, or handle management. So things like title, you can just do title, right? Hello world, um, X label, you know, Y label. So you can look at those in the slides again and in the help. <clears throat> and, be, and, and it's there because those are so commonly used that it would be kind of silly to make you have to go and store a handle and then get its attributes and this kind of thing for very commonly. So there's these ones and that's why I documented them in the slides here, title, X, Y, Z label, uh, legend, um, uh, be able to uh, create just a line on your plot that's existing, uh, be able to put some text on the plot, uh, clear the axes or clear the uh, figure. And you can play with each of those um, uh, on your time there. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to mention on that. I just, uh, just lost it, it'll come back to me uh, in a second there. So that's everything you can do. Uh, you can, this is kind of the beginning of being able to do things programmatically, but there may be more attributes that you want to control than that. And that's where this concept of this handle management comes in. And it's basically that you have axes uh, that are children of figures, uh, you know, off of your main session, like I showed you, you can have multiple figures. Each of those figures can have multiple plots, which in the handle world are called axes. And then each of those axes can have multiple lines. And there's attributes at all of those levels that you can control. And you can control them through this thing called um, the handle management. Really what this ends up, what this is, is every time, when you remember we introduced that concept of a struct early on, which are these name value pairs? Well, when a plot is built, there's a whole structure built and it has a structure that has children, that has more structures, that has children, depending on how deep you want to go with it. So if you're wanting to deal with attributes of a line, a line is um, a structure child of an axis, which is a structure child of a figure. And you can basically walk down that tree and then set those various uh, values accordingly. So uh, the two biggest helpful commands are get, which reflect the structure underneath the handle that's given to it, and then the set, which actually goes in and sets the name value pair um, on the structure itself. So let's take a look at this guy here. So we're going to clear this out. I'm gonna keep the plot in there. And I'm gonna start by, well actually, um, let me store, let me close it and store the plot. Uh, so you got my numbers here? Okay, so I will uh, store it and I'll call it um, handle one. And I'm going to do plot of A, B. All right, so now I've stored that handle. Now, if I want to look at what is, what are all the attributes that are hanging off of that handle, and in this case, um, it's giving me the handle of the axes because I had done a plot. I could have also just opened a figure and done the, got, but, but figures actually use the handles, like figure one, figure two, figure three, those are the handles. Those are nice in, integer based. After that, it goes, crazy and you got to store them because they're these kind of crazy random numbers. So here, when I did the plot, I actually have the handle that goes with that particular axis. If I had done a subplot, each of the axes under the subplot would have a different handle. 
So you can think of it like that. So figure can have multiple axes under it. In this case, I only put in one axis just to show the base demo here. So what I can do now is do this get H1. And what it effectively does is says, hey, go and tell me about what's in that structure. And when you look here, you see that it's got um, a line style in that axis. It's got a line width uh, in that axis. Uh, it's got some color information. And I can either set data at that level or um, I can go uh, and dive deeper into the actual um, actual uh, structure and go from there. So let's go here and start with um, a GCF, which is that. And then there's this handy thing called GCA, which is if you remember I, early on I did a plot and then um, I kind of closed it. I could have also done a GCA, which gives me uh, the current handle um, uh, that I'm working with. So in this case, uh, I'm going to do a get on the GCA to actually get the handle of the uh, specifics of that axis. So um, well, actually what happened here is when I stored, um, one thing I, I misspoke on, when I first stored this, this handle, um, I was actually getting, it went all the way down to the to what I created. I created a line, so it gave me the that uh, handle for the line. I didn't want to go that deep because uh, I wanted to go to the axis level and show you that. So let me start by, um, so I don't confuse you too much here. Let me clear the screen. Um, put that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is actually get um, the, let's get the axes, I'll call it H2, um, the handle for the current axes, which is GCA. So that, I'm, I'm just kind of repeating what I did earlier, but I didn't want to go all the way down to the line, which is what I did when I said uh, plot the line. I want to go up to the axes because I want to show you what you see when you do a get GCA. So there's the structure for the entire axes there. So you see a bunch about the X and the Y. Uh, the, and, and Z, it's not really populated, but you see that because it's all part of that. And what you'll notice sometimes is you'll see other handles underneath it. Like here, notice the X label is itself a handle. And that's because that's another structure underneath that carries all the attributes of uh, the X label. So let's see if we can get that handle. So here I'm going to get um, H2, and I want to get the uh, X label, and that should be handle. So I'll store that in H3 just to do that. So let me do that again here and store it in H3. So what I'm doing is I got the axis handle, and I saw a list of attributes. There's attributes there that I can set directly, like grid on or off. There's also additional handles, and now I'm going to step down deeper, and I'm picking one of them. I'm picking the X label. So I'm going to look here um, and store H3. And now if I get H3, I get the attributes that go with that uh, X label. And that's where the set comes in. So now I can do a set on H3 string, uh, which I think has to be in quotes, and hello, this stuff has to be in quotes, hello world. There it is. You see the X label just pop up? Um, I can also go here and set it to something different. Nothing. Or GGG. We're going to run out of time here pretty quick. So let me just show one other example on that is if I go back to uh, looking at what's under H2, which is the axes, one of the things that I see is uh, this grid, the X grid being off. So let's go ahead and turn X grid on. To do that, I would set, in this case, it's H2. I'm going to pick number and name, name value pairs. That's what the structures have. So I got to give it the name. And I got to give it the value. So I will do uh, X grid and on. And you just see the graph popped up with the X grid on. So you can play with this. Um, the way to start it out is just GCA gives you that. You do a get on, the, on that handle. And then you can either set and give the name and the value you want or you can do an, a, um, a get on one of the handles that are inside and go one step deeper and keep doing that. And that gives you access to just about every attribute 
for the plot. So we're running a little uh, tight, so I wanted to jump right over here. Page 59 uh, is the exercise, and uh, I will hang on until 5.30, and then um, by all means, if there's exercises that you didn't have a chance to complete because we needed to compress it a little bit today, uh, it's worth taking some time to walk through those. But I will remain um, muted and online for about another seven minutes, and then Darius, you can come on at the end and close us up. Time. Thank you, John, and, and I think we're uh, pretty good here. Uh, there will be nothing additional to add except uh, for everybody to try to uh, meet with us again tomorrow. And uh, again, please use this time to ask questions, and uh, and if you have more tomorrow, you know we'll, we'll start off again uh, asking to see if anybody has any questions.